Muted. Helps if I unmute. Oh, goodness, what a day. Welcome, welcome to Saturday Chat Live. Um, it's good to have you. We're going to keep this uh, to around 30 minutes, as I usually do, give or take. We'll see how everything sort of goes. So I'm going to wait a few minutes for some more people to roll in who want to join the live stream. And uh, of course, as always, feel free to put your comments and questions and whatever else you might have in the chat, and I will do my best to answer them to the best of my ability. Of course, I am not a human Wikipedia, so I can't always answer everything, but I will do the best I can. All right, so obviously, uh, one thing you want to get out of the way, obviously this is September 11th, the 20th anniversary of September 11th is a very solemn uh, day for many of us here in the U.S. and around the world. So I don't want to say too much about that, but just um, say we, we honor those that uh, were lost that day and in and around the events of that day. And in my opinion, the best way to honor in anyone who is a victim of, of anything like that or, or whatever is to just try to live a good life of kindness and love and generosity and understanding and integrity and do the best we can. That's, that's how we... Um, honor those who did not get to live out their full life, in my opinion. So I will leave it at that and let everyone you know, uh, experience this day in their own personal way. It's not my not my place to go any more into that. But I did want to mention it at least because it is uh, today. All right, so what is on the agenda for the next 30 minutes or so? Talk about the uh, what I'm doing on the channel. Where do I think we're going to go from here? And of course, I will uh, answer any comments, questions you have. I have a couple of books I might show you here and there, and then we'll we'll call it a day so you can get on with your day and I can get on with my day because we all have better things to do today after this and just listen to me blab. All right. So, all right. Um, this is funny. So, Basan said, I thought this was Zach Braff. You know what? I will take it. If you want to, Zach, I will take Zach Braff. That's fine. Um, oddly enough, you know how many comments I've gotten on my channel of people that say I sound like Seth Rogen? Maybe I do from the outside, in my own ears and head. I don't think I sound like Seth Rogen, but again, I guess I'll take it. Um, you really think I sound like Seth Rogen and look like Zach Braff? Uh, I'll, I'll take it. All right. So where is the channel at? So I just finished a video. I think I released it last week on multiple regression where we looked at the uh, AIC, the AICC, uh, um, you know, and some of the other metrics that go, the BIC, of course, that go into evaluating multiple regression models. So I released that. Right now I'm you know, thinking about where I wanna go next. There are many, many, many things we could go into with multiple regression. So you have to stop somewhere and I'm trying to figure out if this is the best place to, to stop and do something else or continue on. So, um, all right, well, so I'll, I'll figure it out. You know, a lot of you have want me to do videos on time series, uh, machine learning, design of experiments, and some other more advanced sort of topics. And it's hard to pick exactly where we wanna go from here, but I am evaluating. I do have several ideas. I'm never at a loss for ideas. So I'm still thinking about it. Um, and of course, you can always message me on uh, YouTube, on LinkedIn is probably the best place. On my website, I have a little form you can uh, submit. I will say this time of year, my inbox on all of those blows up. So LinkedIn, YouTube, the contact form on my website because of school starting, it tends to blow up in September. I do the best I can to answer those questions and respond, but this is you know, the, the busy time, it gets really, really busy the next few months, especially. So if you, um, if you don't hear back from me, it's not, I'm not being rude. It's just, there, there are just so many messages and things coming in. So I, I do the best I can. Um, and I apologize if I don't always get to your question or comment or whatever else it might be. I do want to say congratulations. I've seen that many of my followers and connections on LinkedIn, um, are starting new positions. Um, and kind of reorienting th themselves in their career. Now, of course, there are many people who are still looking for for a job or a career, um, and it is hard. But I do see every day 
you know, dozens of you that do start new positions. I want to say congratulations. I know it's very difficult and I wish you all the best in those new positions. And those companies are very lucky to have you. And I hope you make the best of that opportunity and develop the career, the career you want. So congratulations to you. All right. All right. What else we got here? Oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon to you too. All right. Vince, Watching from the Philippines. Hello, Vince. Hope you're doing well in the Philippines. Um, there are many places in the world I'd like to make it to someday. That area is definitely one of them. Um, hello from India. So, of course, as anyone who's been around the channel knows, I have a lot of viewers in India, and I'm very grateful for all my viewers in India. I love you all so much. I'm so appreciative of the support you have given me, and it's been great watching you all grow and develop in, in your careers in schooling. Again, top of my list of places to get to someday so I can say hi to all of you, give you all hugs, and thank you for all of your support um, in India. So it's good to good to see you. That's what it was. Um, appreciate your work. Huge love. Huge love back. Thank you. That's from Pakistan. Excellent. Excellent. Um, there's some other comments here. Nice to see you again from Spain. I'd love to roam around Spain for a month or two. It's so beautiful. Thank you. Romania, excellent. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Um, Aulia, I think I'm saying that right. As I always say on these streams, many of you are overseas and things like that. And um, unfortunately, have names I'm not familiar with. So if I mispronounce your name, I do apologize. I do the best I can in real time to, um, to pronounce them properly, as you deserve. Um, but... You know, I'm just trying to do the best I can with the name. So I do apologize if I if I say your name wrong. All right. Let's see here. Um, time series analysis, please. That would be great. That's definitely one of the you know top three or four topics people have been asking for. So, and I do have an interest in time series because, of course, it is related to regression in many ways. So it's kind of like a branch sort of, the, in my view, in regression. So it might be something I do. Thank you. Um Hello from Nepal. Again, other place I'd like to go visit someday. All right. Um, yeah, keep the keep the comments coming. Keep the chat coming. It's good to see all of you. All right. So, oh, um, one of the things on my agenda I did want to um, talk about uh, up here up, up front is that um, I wanted to say thank you to um, Janet Dobbins from statistics.com and Peter Bruce, who is an author. So I connected with Janet on LinkedIn, and then uh, out of the blue, I walk out to my mailbox and there's this package in it. I'm like, oh dear, what did I order from Amazon? And I forgot, like, what is this thing? So I open it up, look at the address, open it up, and actually it's a book. So Janet um, from statistics.com sent me a very, very nice handwritten note here. It's a very, very nice handwritten note um, and everything like that. And by the way, this is not sponsored or anything. This is not promotion or nothing like that. Uh, this just came out of the blue. I didn't ask for anything. But uh, Janet sent me this book. It's Practical Statistics for Data Scientists um, by O'Reilly. And I've been, uh, I didn't have a chance when it first came to look through it, but I have the past couple of days. And um, actually on the inside, the author Peter Bruce signed it um, to Brandon Foltz, a fellow teacher. And uh, that means a lot to me. If any of you knows, uh, that means a whole lot, whole lot to me. So this book, I've been reading through it, and it's not very big. So it's pretty, it's pretty thin, but its size belies the, the valuable content within, within it. Um, what it basically does is it takes like 50 essential concepts for data scientists, some, some um, stats concepts in data science and really condenses it down to like sometimes just a paragraph or two or three, sometimes two or three pages, very, very concise and just outlines sort of the main points and with a few examples. And the code in here is like done in R, but the code examples for R are very, very short, um, like very, very short, like here. So if you're really interested in learning about some of these 50 fundamental ideas and get a little R practice in the process, which honestly I could use too, um, this is a good this is a good book. 
I think pedagogically, it's also very, uh, very sound. So, you know, key ideas, key terms, it's very well done in terms of like a learning design uh, type perspective. And uh, yeah, I really like it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna dig into it some more. It's not, there's not very much math in it or anything like that. So yeah, so I wanted to thank Janet from statistics.com and uh, Peter Bruce, the one of the authors here, for uh, sending me this nice note and the signed book. And I do, rec I do recommend checking this out if you think that's a good fit for you. Again, not sponsored. I didn't even ask for the book. It just showed up in my mailbox. Um, so yeah, I would definitely want to, uh, to give that a shout out. So thank you all very much for that. All right. What else we got going on here? Okay, in the chats. Um, yeah, we'll turn that off there. All right, so yeah, talk about um, some of the things you got going on, some of the projects you got going on, what you might like to see on the channel and, and so forth. So I will say that as far as this show goes, Saturday Chat Live, I think every two weeks is a good cadence right now. So there aren't a whole lot of new things to talk about in one week. So I think two weeks is sort of a good a good cadence. I'll probably stick to that. Maybe as it gets closer to like exam season, I might you know do one every week uh, for people. But as of right now, we're going to stick to probably you know every every two weeks and so on and and so forth. So. As of right now, that is my that is my plan, you know. So I am working on several ideas. I'm considering maybe doing a Udemy course for the first time. We'll see. That takes a lot of time to put that put that together, especially at the level of con uh, the level of quality that I would want to do it. But I know exactly what I would do. I have the entire thing mapped out, how I would approach it. It's just time. You know, there's just there's just not enough time. I mean, I uh I don't do YouTube full time or anything like that. I have a full time career, and YouTube and stuff like that are kind of on the side. And I do the I do the best I can. Do want to apologize if you hear things behind me. It's a beautiful day here in Ohio in the U.S., and um, all the wildlife are making lots of noise. So if you hear that, that is what that's what you're hearing. So, all right, what else is going on? Post some comments and thoughts in the chat, and I will do my best sort of sort of to answer them. Um, thank you, Amy. Hi from Singapore. Love your videos. Thank you for making it. You are very welcome. That's what I, that's what I make them for. You know, if you've been on the channel long enough, you know that I don't do this for glory or fame or money or anything like that. I do it just to help people. Um, yeah. So Udemy course on just statistics or question mark. I'm going to just say question mark at this point. If I get to the point where I'm pretty sure I am going to do it, then I'll talk more about it. But it is kind of a different, unique idea, and I do kind of want to keep it close to the vest, um, and mainly because I'm not exactly set 100% on what it might turn out. I know the general idea, um, but we'll see. It will be related to statistics, of course. So I'm not going to do a course on you know, painting landscapes, which there are great courses on painting landscapes, but I won't do that. All right. Um, let's see. I do my best to answer these separate questions. How can I statistically analyze an experimental design that combines a two-by-two two ANOVA with a control group not included in the factors? Really have to see the design of this study beyond just that. Um, remember that ANOVA is really just a, a cousin of regression. So sometimes these type of problems can be set up as regression problems. Sometimes I find it easier to set up these as regression problems and then use the co, sort of use a covariate, you know, or control for something or something else. So again, these type of questions are, are difficult to answer without looking at the design, the study, um, and stuff like that, but there are there are ways to do that. Um, and of course, there are many many books you can you can look at. On that, I'm trying to think if I have one handy. That's a good one. Oh, hold on. Yes, I do this all the time. As you know, I am famous for getting up out of this chair and going over all my books and dragging them out. So, um, 
couple of I, I think I um, pulled these up last last show, but I'm going to do it again. So on on when it comes to this these type of things, um, some some books and some resources are good at some things, and some are good at other things, right? So I tend to think that these sort of design of experiments questions, you can find really good information in like statistical books about say like psychology. So one of my favorites is the Cohen book, explaining psychological stats. Uh, has all oh, it's it is it's it's a huge book. The previous edition was about two thirds of the size, but you know when you talk and here's I actually opened it to this sort of question. So when you're talking about designing experiments and stuff like that, a good resource to look for and how to set them up are like psychological stats books or even biological sort of stats books. Because not all statistical analysis is really set up for experimentation, right? So you, you try to find the things that are um, uh, good for experimentation. So this Cohen book is very good. I actually have the previous edition, or one of the previous editions. It's very old. So I got the current, the more, the most current edition used, of course. And um, I was like, this thing is huge. You can like. You can hammer in deck nails with this thing, but it's a good book. I really like the way he explains things. Um, and then multivariate, okay. This is a famous one, Dubachnik, one of my favorite books um, that you can look at um, as well. So if you're looking for resources on that sort of thing, those are things I recommend. You don't even have to get the latest edition necessarily. You can get you know previous one and you can go to uh, my, one of my favorite websites is called allbookstores.com. And basically, it's sort of a marketplace where um, that sort of collates used books in like one site and goes out and finds them all. And that's kind of where I get my used uh, books from. So I have to be careful because I have a tendency to collect books. So I don't, um, you know, I don't go in there too often because I end up with a bunch of books on my house. All right. Let's see. I'm look at the chat here. So, um, so Nick says this book right here, which book, which book is a forty nine ninety nine book? Um, I don't know. This book lists for 40 us dollars, but I'm sure if you go on Amazon, it's probably cheaper. And of course, if you get maybe the Kindle version, it might be cheaper. So, um, it depends on where you go find it, you know? All right. Um, let's see. Record this presentation to see it later if needed. So the live streams are always recorded on YouTube. You can go back and watch them at any time uh, on my channel. I think there's like a tab that says live. So they're they're all on there. So they're always recorded, all right? Okay. Um, any words of encouragement to get us fired up for winter, summer internship applications? Um, it's going to get hectic over the next few weeks. Yes, it is. So it's hard. Questions related to this are really dependent on your individual situation, what field you're in, the, the job and business climate in which you're going for internships. Many things that can contribute, you know, to these sorts of things. One positive I will say now is that the job market, at least... I know here in the U.S., and I think other places in the world, it's very hot, hot job market. So there are probably, on balance, more opportunities now than there would in a sort of typical sort of time. But look, the best thing you can do for any internship application or job application, for that matter, is just be genuine, be authentic, be yourself. Showcase your talents and your best work, um, but also what you might do in the future. You know, how can you help out that business? How can you help out? that company meet their goals and just treat it like a conversation of something you want to be part of, you know, talk to people maybe at the company or people that have been there or other people that are applying in the same situation and you can learn from them and then, you know, put your best, put your best foot forward. So these processes are very competitive and we don't always get the, the one we want or the one we think, you know, we should uh, be in or whatever else, but let's keep trying, you know, all right. Um, 
Let's see here. What motivated you to study statistics? This is actually a very good question. I'm not sure if I've ever talked about this. So I'll try to keep it short, you know, because I do want to keep um, our time concise here. Um, so I've always been a math and science person. So my my sibling, my brother, is more of like a language arts type type person. He's very good with language and has a, like a photographic memory. Um, spelling bee champion, that's that's my brother. I am not like that. I'm a science and math person. I always have been. So I was always playing outside. I was figuring out how to jump my bike further, like the angle of the ramp and my speed to get the best trajectory. Um, I grew up loving the U.S. space program, the, the, the uh, shuttle program. I've always been a, a math and science person. So I naturally have a, an interest in it. Until I got to undergraduate, and then actually graduate school and had statistics classes. And um, they were a lot harder than, harder than I anticipated being a math and science person because I think it's very hard to teach um, in, a, in an effective way. I'm not saying the people that were teaching it were bad teachers. I just think that content is sometimes counterintuitive. We're not really exposed to the ideas explicitly in statistics and so forth. Um, so what kind of developed is that I kind of taught myself a lot of the content. And then I realized through graduate school and other sort of venues, that a lot of, the, a lot of other students on campus needed help. So I basically became a tutor. I've been, a, I've been a tutor my entire life, but especially when I was at a large university, there were many, many students that needed help, whether in, in either finite mathematics or statistics, or sometimes both. So basically I became a very um, popular tutor on campus on those topics and really kind of developed from there, you know, spending hours and hours and hours in the main library helping students, um, you know, learn these things. So over time, I just developed ways of explaining things and understanding them. And I thought the best thing I could do was share that with the world. And then when the Great Recession happened, you know, about 10 years ago, I started the YouTube channel because I couldn't do anything else. There were no jobs then. Now it's the opposite. So I just started the YouTube channel to help people. And that's how I got into it. So it's a, it's a mix. It's a mix of my natural interest, but it's primarily my interest in like learning and development and improvement and helping students sort of get through their goals and onto their careers and so on and so forth. So to help people. All right. Um, okay. I could talk about that forever, but I don't want to, um, you know, bore, bore you too much. All right. Uh, let's see here. Da -da. No, I do not. I do not gamble on sports. I do not gamble on anything. The thing about gambling is once you understand the mathematics, it loses its luster. So no, if I ever do gamble on anything, I might play like blackjack or something. But I know the odds and blackjack has very specific rules and I know I'm probably going to lose. So I kind of, even if you play the, by the rules, the casino set up the payouts and some of the rules so that they win in the long run, right? So if I go into a casino and play blackjack, I view it as I lose the money as a form of entertainment because playing is fun. All right. Enough about that. Let's see here. Um, there's, a, there's a conversation going on in the chat already, so I will let you all um, do that. So there's, yeah, um, Pratik had some questions about covariance between two categorical variables. So that's going on in the YouTube chat. I could put the whole thing up, but you can, you can look at it yourself. All right. Um, Let's see, what else do we got going on here? I'm gonna keep an eye on the chat. So if you have any other comments, questions, or whatever, just for a little drop them in. I'm gonna go, we'll go a few more minutes here. We're already, these things go by so fast. You look up, it's like 25 minutes in. It goes by so, so fast. Yeah. Um, all right. So I'm just gonna put up this conversation um, here. Covariance between two categorical variables. Or correlation, there are there are different types of correlation. Um, 
So correlation doesn't always have to be between two numerical quantitative uh, variables. So there are correlations you can do between an ordinal data and so forth. So I don't use these very often, so please forgive me off the top of my head. I might get the, the name sort of wrong, but I know there's a point by serial correlation. And actually, I could sit here and look it up. But there are... Um, there are other types of correlation that can be done with non sort of new, you know, continuous data. Um, what's, the, what's the other one I can't, there's another, there's a third one I can't think of the top of my head. So you have Pearson correlation, you have point by serial. What's the other one? Somebody in the chat knows the third one where I can just get my book um, over here and look at it. Why not? We just make do. Oh, there's another book I want to show you. I almost fell out of my chair. That was hilarious. Um, what is the third one? See? I get into this. I can't not look it up now. Because I don't use these things very often. Sorry, I shouldn't be doing this on a live stream. But someone asked. So here I am. Mm. Okay. This is making up for a really boring live stream as I look up stuff. My apologies. Okay. I can't think of it. So I will... Pratik, hit me up on LinkedIn or send me a message and I'll try to answer your question better than me. Spearman, maybe it's Spearman. Aha, George, my man, I assume. I don't know if George, George can be other name. So George, Spearman is the other one I think I was thinking of. So yeah, so I think you have the Pearson correlation, point by serial and the Spearman is the third. So go to look those up, <laughs> the Google machine, the Wikipedia. If you look on, if you look under the heading for correlation, you'll find several implementations of, of correlation. So that is maybe, um, where I would look. Yeah. So I think that's it. See, you all are brilliant. Thank you for helping out my brain fart. All right. Um, here we go. Ooh, some more questions. All right. Any new furniture pickups recently? Remind me what that was regarding. Um, I don't have any new furniture furniture pickups, at least yet. How do you keep yourself up to date? This is a good question. How do you keep yourself uh, an update in the field of machine learning and deep learning? Several things. I read a lot. I do a lot of Udemy courses. I watch a lot of YouTube videos. Um, when I say I read a lot, I mean I read a lot. Like, I just finished like a 400-page book on machine learning. I read it cover to cover. I didn't do the code examples yet. I'm going to go back and do the code examples. So I read books. And the best way I learn is to consult learning from multiple places. And then my brain starts making all these links between everything because each resource explains it slightly different. So this resource might explain something one way, another resource might explain something a little bit different. And what I do is I, in my head, my whole life, I've kind of like made all the connections and you know, mash them together and, and stuff like that. So that's how I learn. But look, it just takes time, it takes effort, it takes practice. The best ways to learn anything are the proven ways to learn anything are one, to come up with your own questions and explanations, number one. Two, the best way to learn something is to continually test yourself. And you learn by the things you get wrong, not the things you've gotten right. So continually test yourself in some way. So you can, you can buy or make your own flashcards that have you know questions and answers on them. You can do that. Um, yeah, so 
There are multiple ways to keep yourself up to date, but I think just reading, you can follow blogs, LinkedIn, of course, you know, always has new stuff coming out, follow people on LinkedIn. You can follow groups on there to see what is up to date and what's going on, but just keep practicing, keep learning, keep testing yourself, you know, coming up with your own explanations is, is the best way to learn. That is the best way to learn. All right. Um, all right. Okay. Da, 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 da. You are having your own internal conversation about this question, which I love. Awesome. That's it. All right. I'm going to take a sip because my mouth starts getting dry. Hmm. I did one more book to show you, by the way. All right. Getting internship opportunities for undergrads or refreshers in data related fields seems a bit tough. How in depth knowledge of statistics required according to your experience? For an internship, in depth knowledge of statistics, or anything for that matter, what well, depends. My, my two favorite words on this live stream are it depends. So it depends on the opportunities you are pursuing, what the requirements might be. It's better to be over prepared than under prepared. Um, but in general, I think internships are designed to be learning opportunities, not for you to be, you never really can be, but not to be like a finished product, right? So it really just, it really just depends. And one thing I want to point out here is all of the learning you do, whether it's in statistics or machine learning, whatever it might be, in my view, it's just as important to build out your network. So build out your professional network. At, at almost all levels. So a lot, of, you know, a good deal of the opportunities you will come across in life are done through your network, through people you know, people you have met, whether it's at school or a conference or some other virtual organization or whatever else. Spend time building out your network. There are no guarantees, but that's um, a good place to start, you know. So, um, yeah, so in-depth knowledge, it, it just depends, but it's better to know too much, not enough. But I don't think it's worth sacrificing other things to go too far in-depth in these topics at this stage. That's just my my sort of opinion. Um, so, yeah. Um, all right. Let me see here. Da -da -ba -da -ba -da. Um. So, Jeet, I came across a question while solving it, and alpha was divided into half. Why is that? That's most likely because it was a two-tailed test. It wasn't a directional test. So, you look at the, you know, the normal distribution. If the hypothesis is set up as equal to or not equal to, we don't know really which direction, so we have to evenly distribute alpha in both tails of that distribution for our test statistic. Of course, you can have one-tailed tests if we are testing whether or not something, you know, is, is greater than or less than some hypothesized value. That would be a one-tailed test. And in that case, we put all of our alpha in one of the tails. So when you see the alpha divided by two, that is just most likely, I don't know the exact sort of thing here, but um, it's a two-tailed test because we don't know which direction it might fall. I should I click on this? So, yeah. Uh, how large the M must be chosen? The probability simple mean lies within. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is kind of a question about sample size, and a lot of these sort of if you find the formulas to these sorts of things, you'll realize that if you have all the all the pieces, and you're missing one piece, just using some basic algebra, you can find the missing piece. So in cases sort of like this, where you're trying to find like a confidence interval, so you have, you know, the value plus or minus the margin of error. Well, if you have anything missing in there, in this case it might be the N, to get a certain interval, the, the you don't find the interval, you're given the interval, and then you have to solve for the N in that equation to find the value of N that would give you that sort of interval. So basically it's just algebraic reorganization. 
but this is be but this specific thing is because it's a two tailed, um, it's a two tailed test. That'd be my, that'd be my guess here. All right, ooh, now the chat is fired up. Um, doing some videos on Cox regression, survival analysis, probit, Tobin regression, social science research, maybe. Um, Jay Greedy, maybe. So I'm going to get my little handy. I've actually had this question more than once. So I'm going to get my handy notepad that I keep right here. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. So jot, I'm jotting, jotting these things down. One challenge of making videos on YouTube is that, let's say I have, over the course of two weeks or whatever, I have 10 hours to spare to make a video. So my goal is to make a video that benefits the most people. I could spend 10 hours making a video that helps a very small slice, sliver, um, of individuals out there, or I can make a video that helps a large number of people. And of course, I tend to go for the larger, the larger um, number of people because the unit of time, say 10 hours, is the same, but the people on the end that benefit are more. So I try to pick those topics. So I will, I will try to do some more research and maybe see sort of what the demand is for these sorts of things. And then if I can come across the idea that there is enough demand, then that's when it would make sense for me to do a video about it. So that's kind of the way my calculus, in my calculus, not calculus like calculus, but calculus in my mind works about decisions. All right. Um, but I'm just trying to go through here and pick out a few because I do want to wrap this up. Maybe about seven or eight minutes. Sorry, I have an itch or lint or something on my nose. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Um, so Nick says, good way to break through subject matter is to physically write out the textbooks you are studying. Um, if we're talking about just copying a book and physically writing out the exact sort of same thing, um, that's not a good way to learn. Scienti I mean, the evidence says that's not a good, or nor is highlighting or anything like that. It's, it is a very good way to learn to synthesize and summarize information you might be reading in a book. And most importantly, come up with your own questions and explanations and test yourself. Are the two evidence-based ways, the two evidence-based ways to learn. Another tier down from that is spaced rehearsal. So learn something and then a little bit later in time, go over it again. And then a little bit later in time again, go over it again. And if you space out that learning, you space out that rehearsal, the retention goes way up. Now, the trade-off is that that takes time. That just takes a lot of time to do. So you know, there are a lot of proven ways to learn material. And the two best are testing yourself repeatedly, reflecting on that, writing out your own questions and answers. And then sort of the next tier is sort of, you know, space rehearsal, or interleaving, interleaving rehearsal. So if I were to write a textbook, um, what I would do in that textbook is actually have content from earlier chapters, filter through to later chapters, and be integral to the book. So we're always kind of circling back on the content and that's how it sticks. And, you know, some people on my channel um, have criticized the fact that I tend to repeat things, but that's on purpose. So yes, I will come back a few months later and restate in a different way, the same concept, because that's fundamentally sound teaching and learning science. So that's just the way we absorb information. That's the best way to do it. And it just takes time to do that. One of the reasons I'm a natural learner in my life is because I naturally come back to things. So I will learn something, I'll put it down. Sometimes weeks, months, or even years, I'll put something down. Then later I'll come back to it. So all these books I have over here to, to my right are books I had 20 years ago but I kept the ones I think I might want to go back to someday and I will. So I always come back 
to things I learned in the past and rethink and reevaluate them. So, all right. Um, let's see here. <sighs> what else have we got here? Mm. Yeah. Um, if you really want to, some more comments about how to learn things in here, you know, depending on how much time you have, you know, repeating and rewriting things that you see evidence-wise are not the best way to retain information. So everyone can do what they you know, want and it makes them, you know, feel like they learn the best. But if you have a limited amount of time, which most of us do, then testing yourself and stuff like that. It's, be it's better to take the time. If you're going to write something out, in my opinion, this is my view as a teacher, as an educator. If you're going to write stuff out from something you're reading or doing, your best, your best bet is to make yourself flashcards. And then continually test yourself on using those flashcards. Um, da, 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 da. Let's see here. Michael asked, why do we get an R... R squared adjusted value many tab when I only have one variable. Do I ignore that or is it still valid? I assume you mean one sort of predictor variable or one independent variable. I'd have to know the application. So of course you can have a simple regression where you have one predictor and one outcome, or of course we call it one independent variable, one dependent variable. And if that, will, you'll, that will give you an R squared because you have sum of squares. You have a total sum of square situation there which are which is decomposed into sum of squared errors, sum of squares to the, to the regression. And of course the, the R square is the proportion of the sum of squares regression of the total sum of squares. So you will get that R squared anytime you have a sum of squares situation. So like the R square in regression is one thing. And of course, you will also see root mean square error, sometimes R squared in machine learning applications, but they kind of mean two different things. It's the same general concept, but two different applications of the concept. But in general, anytime you have a sum of squares situation, you're going to get an R squared, adjusted R squared, and so on and so forth. Um, all right. Woo! We are moving here. You all are awesome. You all are awesome. <laughs> okay. Hope you're doing great. Been learning a lot through your videos over the past couple of weeks. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah, you are very, very welcome. You're very welcome. That's why I do it for people like you. Um, this is another request I've had is SEM, so structural equation modeling on my list. So, um, yeah, that's I will keep that on my list. Again, it's a situation of just time and reach. So, let's see here. What do we got going on? Um, we make videos on types, types of logistic regression. So if you can expand upon what do you mean by types, I have a whole playlist, um, of logistic regression. If there's something beyond sort of what I've done specifically, um, please drop it in the chat and I'll go you know, do some research on that. But I obviously have a very, very popular playlist on logistic regression. So, all right. Um, Wesley says Anki is a good piece of free software for spaced repetition learning. This is exactly what I was saying before. I'm going to write this down. So spaced repetition learning is by far one of the best ways to retain information. It's spaced repetition, spaced rehearsal. There's another company called Serago um, that I sort of learned about through my job and stuff like that that does the same same thing basically without going into the weeds i don't remember the exact person's name but forgive me the way our brains learn it's, it's a curve you know so over time we learn something and then it starts to decay like our, re our recall of that information begins to decay actually i should do it this way to you oh well, is it this way down yeah or information, it, it begins to decay. So the trick is as something we learn in our in our mind begins to decay over time, we pick it up again. And then it'll decay again. And then maybe a little bit longer. 
then we pick it up again and then the decay is a little bit less so as what we learn decays we want to space out picking it up again and sometimes that can be hours sometimes that can be weeks or whatever there are lots of interesting studies on learning and i think one of the ones i recall was um you know, students were put into experimental groups, and then one one group learned something. They they came back to it at a much shorter interval, and then the other group came back to it spaced out over a longer interval. And of course, the students that had more time between each spaced rehearsal repetition retained much much more, much much more. So it's about spaced rehearsal and spaced repetition. So that's. Um, that's what I would do. Some people do that naturally. Like I do that naturally. I don't try to do it on purpose, but what happens is I learn something and then I come like a, I'm like a squirrel. It's like, Oh, look at that over there. Oh, look at that over there. Oh, look at that over there. And then eventually I, after doing that enough times, I come back full circle to something I learned before and I pick it up again. And that's why I've been a lifelong learner the whole, my whole life. I think that's just part of it. All right. So... Larry, what's up, buddy? It's good to see you, my friend. Hope you're doing well over there. Say hi to the fam for me. Hope you're doing well. So one of my thoughts on Bayesian statistics, Bayesian statistics is very important. It's another way of looking at the world. It's obviously very prominent um, um, in ML applications, but it is a different way of looking at the world. And I will admit, when I first started learning more about it, I found it somewhat confusing. But the more I have learned about it, the more it sort of makes sense. And actually what I've learned about Bayesian statistics is that it's often how we think in real life. It's how we tend to think and make decisions like in our everyday lives. You know, so given this, what's the probability of that? We think like that all the time in our normal everyday you know, existence, right? So if we, if you can apply it to how we normally think in our everyday life, it's much easier to understand, I think. But it can be confusing. And I think it's really hard to teach, too. It's one of those things that is challenging to teach. Um, and, of course, there are many resources on YouTube and online where people do teach it very well. You know, StatQuest is obviously the, the one people go to a lot. Josh is fantastic. You can you know, try that. Um, and there are some books on it. Is it worth learning and applying with analytics projects? It is absolutely worth learning and applying. You know, um, but you can start in just basic probability, Bayes' theorem, you know, probability trees is where I would start. So when I was tutoring finite mathematics, of course, we would learn Bayes' theorem through um, trees and, and stuff like that. And you can, trees are cool because they, they flow kind of how we read, they're visual, and you know, you can, um, you can back the conditional probability up visually. So I, I'm a big fan of trees, studying uh, Bayesian statistics and probability um, in general. Uh, but, you know, frequentist and Bayesian are just two different ways of looking at the same problem. I think it's good to have, you know, a basic understanding of both, you know. So, all right. Um, I do want to mention that... The, I finally got my copy. So as many of you know, my day job is I work at Cengage uh, Learning. And um, we just released our, we've been working on this for a long, long time. I'm very, very, very proud of our team for, for this book. And um, it's great. So obviously, it is... Not only about uh, data visualization, but also the business side, like how to communicate, how to, you know, time to insight for your end user. And we worked really, really hard on this. The authors um, are awesome. They worked really, really hard on this uh, book. So if you're somewhere in the U.S. or in the world, I guess, you know, this is now available. A lot of, a lot of courses right now use this in conjunction with their stats class or their analytics class you know, to sort of supplement and build out the, the data viz type part. So um, this is now available. If you have any questions about it, I can I can answer questions. If you're a professor 
or teaching and you want some more information on this, you know, again, my my company does not pay me to show these things or whatever else. It's just this is something I was part of personally. And yeah, see, me right there, senior learning designer, me. Um, and everybody on this list of people is amazing, amazing. So that's the one we've been working on. That's the one we've been working on. All right. Um, this is a new one. My voice sounds similar to Aragorn from Lord of the Rings. I'll take that too. So one of my favorite ser mo uh, movie series. Um, yeah. My Return of the King, I guess. Somehow went from sounding like Seth Rogen to Aragorn. Which pretty much sums up the <laughs> world right now. Um, yeah. Uh, Larry, send me a message on LinkedIn, buddy. And I'll uh, see what I can do for you. All right. I think we are just about out of questions and stuff like that. Oh, we're going 52 minutes. You all are something else. All right. So, um, as of right now, the next... Saturday chat live will be uh, September 25th. Thank you, George, for pointing that out, which will be September 25th, which will work out because I'm having some work on my house done. And I imagine next Saturday you're going to hear, you would hear saws and hammers and all kinds of loud noises, which is not a good set of conditions for live streams. So, um, yeah, but. Yeah, we're going to plan on uh, tw two weeks from now, the 25th, for our next sort of live stream show. And I'm sure I'll have more show and tell and more stuff like that. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up so you all and me as well can get on with the day and all the other obligations we have. Or just sit and relax and get some R&R &R and enjoy the weekend if we can, you know. So, all right, I'm going to wrap this up. But you all are awesome. Thank you for stopping by. And I hope you have a great weekend, and I will see you live at least in two weeks. Take care, you all. Bye-bye.